Hi everyone and welcome to Preparing for Launch, where we talk about the space sector through entertainment, education, advice, and insight. Joining us today we have Harriet Bretzel, the head of business analytics at Astroscale, the co-chair of the Space Generation Advisory Council, and the co-founder of the London Space Network, here to speak about the problems of space debris and the wonderful space community. Time is X minus ten, nine, eight, seven. Hi, Harriet. Now, thank you so much for being here today and welcome to Preparing for Lunch. Could you give a little introduction on yourself and what you do? It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. So I am, as you mentioned, I work as the head of business analysis at Astroscale. So we're a startup that's looking to ensure long term space sustainability. Um, I also, as you kindly mentioned, I'm the co-chair of the Space Generation Advisory Council. So that's a, a non-profit that supports students and young professionals connect to the wider space industry. Um, I haven't been in the space industry all that long in reality. Uh, so I, I had a, uh, I, when I left university, I worked in finance for a few years and had what I kind of call a quarter life crisis, <laughs> decided that was what I, it wasn't what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Um, and actually went back to, to school and did a master's in, in planetary science. And, and that really kind of re-inspired me to follow my passions to, to go into the space industry. And uh, that's where I am now. Oh, amazing. When did you first become passionate about space? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I think it's always been something that's been like a hobby in the background. But honestly, it wasn't really until a few years ago that I realized it was something I could do as a, as a job, as a career. Um, when I was younger, you know, my, my dad would always have the telescope out in the back garden and we'd be looking at the planets and the constellations. Uh, I grew up kind of reading science fiction a huge fan of Carl Sagan uh, and so I think that kind of love of of astronomy and and wonder of the universe was kind of always there uh, but it was something that I I didn't realize again that was something I could do as a real job it kind of seemed like more of a hobby than anything so I kind of just kept it as a low level interest in the background uh, for, for a long time. Yeah that's a good point about not knowing that it could be a a business and kind of a career because I feel like a lot of younger students in like primary school and middle school they think oh I'm really interested and passionate about space but I don't want to be an astronaut so that's that's it there's nothing until I think I got to high school and GCCs I didn't actually think I could go into this it was just oh like, yeah I'm not I'm not going to be an astronaut because I'm afraid of elevators so that's probably not the best thing for me but that's a good point like, that's why we kind of have space careers and UK SEDs and this podcast just to show people that they can go into the space industry and it's not that daunting as it seems. Yeah, absolutely. Like, honestly, you're, you're so many years ahead of me, which is fantastic. And I, I hope that <laughs> if, if like the, the space careers resource that UK says has is absolutely fantastic. And if it can give people that confidence and encouragement to know that these kind of careers are out there, um, then that's exactly what I want to do because you know, I spent four years working at a bank and, and don't get me wrong, I enjoyed it. You know, it was a lot of fun in a lot of different ways, but I wasn't super passionate about it. Right. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't change the past of, you know, the path that my career has taken. But I wish I kind of figured that out sooner that I could go and do this job that, you know, is, is really, really exciting. I'm just like smiling thinking about a career in space. Just like <laughs> talking about it all day long. I can't think of anything better because so I'm a physics major with a kind of co extra concentration in aerospace engineering. Mm -hmm. Just doing that all day just honestly makes me so happy. I think it's the only thing that's gotten me through the lockdown is just doing physics and space stuff and like stuff like this and you can that's work and just reading books about space is the only thing that's gotten me kind of kept me sane through this <laughs> that so is wonderful I think if I was thinking about that and I realized okay if I can do all this like very happily and this is getting me through like a pandemic lockdown then I think it'd be a good kind of business career idea hopefully one day <laughs> I, mean, I, can, I can be happy in that yeah for sure I mean it's one of those things right where you know your day job isn't going to be super exciting every single day right but if you've got that underlying passion in what you're doing 
the the boring things or the challenging things are worth it right you can push through because you know what you're doing is important um and and that's something that is 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 really key when you made the transition from finance to the space industry were there any challenges or limitations that came along with that Oh, oh gosh, yeah. So, so it, it's something where the power of hindsight is incredible, right? Because now, I, now it's a few years gone. I, I can say, oh yeah, I just switched from banking to to space science, and oh how how easy that was. At the time, it was not easy at all, right? Like it, it was very challenging. Um, I think in reality, the biggest challenge, maybe this sounds cliche, was overcoming like my own. Uh, like lack of confidence uh, of thinking that it was something I could do and, and bring value to. It took me a long time to realize that the skills I had developed from working in the finance industry could be useful in the space industry. And th th that was actually, you know, a, a, a kind of selling point, right? Because it made me different. It meant I had this different experience and perspective that I could bring to the space industry that, that other people might might not, right? Um, so really getting over that mindset and, and realizing that I could do it was probably the hardest thing. And then it was figuring out, OK, now, now I think I want to make this jump. Uh, how do I do it? Um, so I was I was working full time in a bank uh, and looking for any and every way I could get involved in the space community in some way, shape or form. So I became the uh, signed up to be the outreach coordinator for the Planetary Society in London, which was super cool. We we did some like really great outreach events, like a, a space up event in, in London. Um, I, I got really involved in the Space Generation Advisory Council, which opened up a whole host of opportunities to go to different events around the world and, and get really get to know other people in the space community that I you know had jobs I didn't even know existed. Um, and then at, at the same time, I started doing uh, evening classes at Queen Mary, the University of London in astrophysics. So I'd, I'd do a day of work and then I'd hop on the tube and go down to Bretham Green and spend three hours learning about galaxies. And that was that really made me realise, OK, if this is something I'm prepared to do, you know, two nights a week um, and I'm finding it fascinating. Then then that's, you know, that's definitely something to pursue. Um, but as you can kind of imagine, that's a lot of work, right? It, it was a lot of investment in time. Uh, it, it, it took a lot of, uh, yeah, it took a lot of time to make that transition. And it wasn't easy, but it was 100% worth it. So no regrets. Wow, that is dedication. You're right, that combination of having the skills in finance. and You did math undergraduate, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. That combination is a really kind of asset to have you know, the business side of space sector, especially working in space debris, when it's all about international relations and projects and it's pitching a project to kind of save lunar orbit. So was that definitely an advantage having the finance background? Yeah, so it, it, it definitely was because, um, well, so it's a tricky one, right? Because I think if you want to work in the space industry, having as much kind of knowledge and experience in, in space related matters is definitely a plus, right? So if I hadn't have done, you know, the part-time study in astrophysics and then planetary science if I hadn't been involved in the space generation advisory council and built up that space knowledge I don't think I would have got the job that I have now um so that that kind of core interest and in, and in knowledge in the space industry I think is definitely key um but I was able to you know use a lot of the experience I have have had in finance to do the job I do right now you know so it, it definitely has come in handy um, and, and sometimes being able to look at things in a different way is, is really useful, right? Because you can kind of ask questions that maybe other people wouldn't have thought of asking because you're looking at it from a different perspective. Mm. What does your role at AstroScale involve? Good question. Um, so, uh, oh gosh, it's a fun one. So one of the, the good things about working for a small company, where well, I guess we're not that small now, so we're about 100 people across uh, four different offices. So our, our headquarters are in Tokyo, we have offices in the UK, Denver and, and Singapore. Um, and so really the way that we see uh, the space debris problem um, and, and how we address it is we break it down into kind of three core segments, right? First, it's a technology problem, right? We need to be able to build spacecraft or develop services that can actually do something about the space debris that's in orbit or prevent future space debris, right? So that's why we're, we've got our 
an orbit demonstration mission called LCD, launching maybe this year, that's going to demonstrate the end-to-end -end technology capability that we need to show to be able to capture and remove pieces of debris or failed satellites in orbit. So technology is, is the first pillar. The second is the policy side, right? Because as you mentioned, you know, this isn't something that one little company can do on its own. We really need international collaboration um, and, and really kind of, you know, uh, government support to change, a, you know, uh, move the space industry to a more sustainable future, right? So we do a lot of work looking at, you know, what are those international policies? What are those standards that the space industry can sign up to? to make sure that we are using space more responsibly and can continue to do that in the future. Um, and then the third pillar is the area that I work most on, which is the business side, right? So it's all very well uh, having this technology, um, but if you don't have a commercial business case to justify using it, then no one will do so, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you can kind of see the analogy to, you know, we went to the moon in 1969, but we didn't go back after you know the early 70s because there was no kind of interest or drive to do so right so what we're really looking at doing is kind of creating the, the business case for debris removal so trying to explain to satellite operators why space sustainability is important and why should they should pay for those kind of services um, so that we can make sure that this is something that is self-sustaining okay fantastic just a little um background for everyone on space debris it is basically dysfunctional human-made objects that are trapped in Earth's orbit that don't serve any useful function anymore. And although we are reliant on satellites for communication, weather, predictions, national security, you name it, there have been over, I think, 8,000 satellite launches since Sputnik. So it's understandable that a lot of them don't have any purpose anymore. They're just kind of there. And these damaged or retired satellites in the orbit cause a lot of potential threat and danger for future missions. So over the years, this issue has started to become like nationally recognized because it's obviously a big threat for future space flight for every country. I, I couldn't have described it better myself. Thank you for doing <laughs> the introduction that I should have no, done from the beginning. Uh, but yeah, it, it's something we kind of take for granted, right? Because, you know, if you were driving along the motorway and your car broke down and your reaction was to just leave it in the middle of the motorway and walk away, people will be like, huh, that's probably not the right thing to do, right? Um, but the, the, we have the same challenge with, with satellites in orbit, right? Because um, if they fail up in orbit, um, as long as they're sufficiently high, there's no kind of external mechanism to bring them down or move them out of the way. They're just gonna stay there in orbit, right? And because they're failed, they have no maneuverability or any capability to dodge other things. Um, so, so we really have this issue that isn't going to get solved unless we do something about it. Exactly. I'll definitely double check the statistic before I put it on the episode, but I think it was 61% <laughs> of the, I think it was like 1,900, 500 satellites right now are retired or damaged or not in use right now. Yeah. Like, so the, so the, the, it's, it's crazy. So the, the way we think about it is there's about 2,000 operational satellites in uh, or, or in orbit uh, around the Earth right now. Um, and over 95% of the objects, the artificial objects in space, are debris. So only 5% of those objects are actually useful satellites, um, which is nuts. Yeah. <laughs> and also just the, fe the future of the world is kind of like space exploration and leaving our planet. You just won't be able to if there's no launch sites anymore because of the impact. It's crazy. I, I remember... Um, on the Astroscale website, there's an image of the Earth and it's kind of all the space debris around it. And that scared me, honestly scared me. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely something that is going to be a kind of growing concern as we look to launch more and more satellites into space in the future. So I, I try not to paint like a too apocalyptic problem, you know, because, you know, it, it's one of those things where, you know, the world isn't going to end tomorrow, but, it's it's very analogous to other issues that we faced on Earth, right? If you think about climate change or plastic in the oceans, you know, the space is an environment like any other, um, and we have to make sure that we use it sustainably if we want to keep getting the best out of it. What do you think the similarities and differences are to climate change? 
and base debris versus climate change. Do you think there are any massive differences from that or similarities? Yeah, oh, it's an interesting one. So I think one of the things that space struggles with is it, it's harder to see the value of it, right? You know, you can, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to, I guess, kind of, you know, walk down the beach and see plastic on, on the, you know, in the sand or to see pictures of, you know, super smoggy cities. And, and the, the effects of climate change are very real and very in your face, right? You can see, you know, the effects of flooding or the effects of, you know, droughts and, and all these kind of things, um, which I think make it very real for people. Um, and, and one of the challenges that, that the space community has is that, you know, it's literally out in space, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, the people can't see that debris floating around above your head. Um, and it's also harder to uh, uh, see the value of, of satellite and, and, and space in our everyday life in such a clear way, right? You know, you know, me and you know that we rely on satellites for a whole host of, of services, but that's not as clear and obvious to, to people kind of more generally. And so I think there's a lot more work to be done to explain the value of space to people in their everyday lives. And then you start to get a better appreciation of why it's important to start protecting it. Exactly. If you could say one thing to kind of a potential client launching a satellite right now, what would you say to them to kind of start? Oh importance of space sustainability for the future generations. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one one thing that I think is very important is that we start thinking about space sustainability uh, and the end of a satellite's life as a core part of the life cycle, right? It, it shouldn't just be an afterthought that you worry about if and when a satellite fails. It should be something that's integrated into your satellite design, into your effective operations whilst your satellite is in operation. Um, and then, you know, you're prepared to deal with any debris mitigation um, when you get to the end of life, if and when that comes to it. So that's kind of really what I want to see is a kind of more integrated thinking about this issue rather than it being, you know, that, that annoying afterthought that people don't want to have to think about. So to make it not an afterthought, when you're launching satellites, how can we make these satellites sustainable and prevent them from becoming space debris in the future? So how can we send stuff into space correctly? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there's a number of different things you can do, right? I mean, one example is having propulsion on your spacecraft, right? So if you get any collision warning alerts, you have the ability to move out of the way, right? That's going to help you with, you know, dodging pieces of debris or other satellites and the like, right? Um, you, you can also think about when are your satellite um, operations going to finish and when are you going to look at bringing down your satellite so you know you might have a satellite that's designed for for five years of operations um, but you might get to five years and it's still working fine and you think oh huh, maybe I can just push it an extra year and we'll see how it goes or maybe I can push it an extra two years and see how it goes and you can see how that thinking kind of gets you into that point where you kind of just push it push it push it and then the satellite fails and then you're stuck, right? So kind of, I, I guess there's there's some thinking to be done there in terms of what's the right approach in terms of reaching the end of life of your satellite. Um, and then the other, I guess, is, you know, the, the kind of orbit that you're in, right? So if we're thinking about low Earth orbit, that can be anything from, you know, 350 kilometers below the International Space Station up to 1400 kilometers, right? And um, and, and the environment is very different when you're low, where you have more atmosphere and your your orbit will decay much quicker. Whereas if you're higher up, you're going to have much less uh, atmosphere, basically negligible. And if you fail, you're going to stay there for a very long time. So if your sunlight is at a much higher altitude, space sustainability becomes really important because uh, anything that goes up there is going to stay there unless you do something active about it. Conversely, at those lower altitudes, you might not need to worry so much about long term space sustainability, um, but you're going to have a kind of more of a space safety problem, right, because you're going to have a much busier environment. Anything that's going up into space has got to pass through those lower altitudes, right? You've also got the International Space Station to worry about, which obviously we want to make sure that that stays safe. Um, so there's different considerations to take depending on where you want to go. Um, and what you want to do. 
Is there a balance between end of life services and active debris removal? Yeah, so the way that AstraScale thinks about that distinction is uh, we consider end of life services to be uh, preventative. The idea is that you can prevent the amount of debris that gets created in the future. So the idea there is that we would be working with satellite operators such that if and when future satellites fail, we can remove those um, from orbit and mitigate the amount of debris that's produced. Uh, the, the, the other side of, of the, the coin, I guess, is active debris removal, which we kind of see as removing debris that's already up there, right? So that's about, um, you know, uh, junk that has already been created that might, you know, we might not be able to kind of future proof those satellites because they're already up there, right? Um, and, and try and kind of bring down those things separately. Do you think there is a specific planned mission or project that the issue of space debris would impact the most? Oh, um, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, I, I guess you could say, you know, anything that's going up into to orbit it is going to have to contend with space debris, right? There's a huge amount of uh, large pieces of space debris that we can track, right? But there's also a lot of small pieces that we currently don't have the capability to know exactly where they are. So anything that's launching up into space should be thinking about uh, space debris and, and how to mitigate that risk. Um, Specifically on that topic of space debris, though, there's a couple of really exciting missions that are going to be coming up in the near future. So uh, the Japanese Space Agency has, has recently commissioned uh, AstroScale to do the first phase of a debris removal mission, which is going to be to launch our own satellite that's going to go up and inspect a um, Japanese uh, rocket body. Um, and then the second phase of that mission, which is to be determined, will be to actually remove that uh, rocket body from orbit. Huh. Uh, and the European Space Agency has got a, a similar project as well. So they have announced funding at the end of last year for the Clear Space mission, which is to uh, remove uh, an ESA rocket body from orbit by, I think, 2025. So, oh, wow. so yeah, so it's exciting. There's, there's things happening. There's lots going on. That's amazing. So it doesn't really matter that much if it's a big satellite or a small satellite it does not really have an impact. Well, so I'd say, you know, the, the kind of surface area is definitely a function of your risk, right? Because if you've got a big surface area, you know, you, you've got more, you well, you've got more area that is, is at risk, right? Whereas if you're something very small, uh, you've got less surface area, which is, is, is exposed to at risk, if that makes sense. So, so it's definitely a function of the size of your satellite. Um, but everyone has got to take it seriously, I'd say. Now, I was reading your paper and really enjoyed it. And I can link it down in the description, but it's about moving forward towards a future of space debris removal service through the evolution of an ADR business model. And I was wondering if you could kind of touch upon some of the key components that you wrote about. Yeah, sure thing. Um, <laughs> I really enjoyed it. I, it was, oh gosh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that 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 uh, piece of work is essentially trying to answer what is a very simple question that we get asked a lot, which is like, okay, so space debris is a problem and we should be taking it seriously, um, but who's going to pay for it and why should they pay, right? Um, and it's it's the same problem that we see in these other environmental problems, right, uh, challenges, right? Uh, who's going to pay for climate change? Who's going to pay to sort out climate change? Who should pay to clean up plastic in the ocean, right? We, we're starting, I think we're we're getting to a more uh, to a to a time where people recognise that space debris and space sustainability is something we need to, to take seriously. Um, but you know, people are still reluctant to put their hand up and say, "Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll pay for it." Right. Um, so the idea is to really kind of work through what the value of debris removal services are and who could benefit from that. Right. Mm -hmm. So I guess the first the first side of that is. Uh, government, right? Because you know you can kind of think of this as an environmental problem, as, as as with other issues that we've talked about. So protecting that environment for the good of all of the actors that are working, um, you know, through uh, you know across the community, that has a kind of universal benefit. Um, and then you know also thinking about how individual satellite operators can benefit from 
uh, these kind of green mitigation practices, be it protecting their own services. So, you know, the, the less debris in orbit, the, the better it is for the, the satellites that they've got in operation. Um, you could, uh, you know, optimize your satellite design so that you're focused on your core mission rather than thinking about uh, all of the debris mitigation uh, considerations. Um, and, and then, you know, more generally, just thinking about being a responsible space vector and what does that mean, right? Um, it's something that some satellite operators take very seriously. Um, and it's something that I think some might overlook. Uh, but it's really important to kind of demonstrate the value of being responsible in space and, and what that means. In the paper, there's a flowchart, I remember, and it was kind of shows that if there's too many satellites, there's an increased collision risk, and that led to more collisions. And then for the company in the end, there would be greater loss of service for them and more propulsion costs. And just it, in the long run, it would be so much more damaging for them financially and the consideration of space debris before they launch. Yeah, absolutely. So that's something that, that works on a, on a kind of individual level and also on a on a system level, right? So uh, what you've kind of started to describe is uh, something known as the Kessler syndrome, which is the idea that if you have debris in orbit, um, you know, the more debris you have in orbit, the, the greater risk you have of collisions. And then the more collisions you have, the more debris that is a result of those collisions. And then the more debris you have, the more probability of collisions you have. And then you can see, you, you know, you potentially get this, this runaway effect of, uh, you know, a kind of un uncontrollable amount of debris in orbit, which ultimately with the because the syndrome means that, you know, you can no longer use space. So that's that's obviously an extreme example, which isn't something that is going to happen overnight. Um, but that risk is there. But, you know, given the fact that, you know, at these higher altitudes, there isn't any other mechanism to remove the debris from orbit. Um, and if we just keep pumping it in, then, you know, we're only heading in one direction and it, it's not not a good way to go. Oh, I don't know why. Even this is a negative outcome in the end. I don't know why I find this whole issue of space debris fascinating. I just really think it's interesting because I didn't learn about this until about a year ago. I realized, OK, space debris and sustainability is a threat. And I don't know. I thought, like, wow, this is crazy how it's kind of and I think a way to describe it is kind of. If you look at on the map of active flights right now across the world, that is what space orbit could be like one day. Mm -hmm. And a lot of kind of impeding like roadblocks in it, it would not end well. The only reason why planes work across the globe is because there's no roadblocks or traffic or, well, there's traffic, but there's nothing getting in the way of it that would harm it. So I think that kind of no. idea that. That analogy works really well because the, the other thing that, that planes have that we don't really have in space is a traffic management system, right? So mm -hmm. if you're flying your plane, you know exactly where all the other planes are. Um, and if you come too close to a plane, there is a very clear set of protocols that says, OK, I'm going to raise my altitude, you lower your altitude. We're going to make sure that there's no chance that we're going to crash, right? Um, and in space, we're still working these things through, right? This is still new. Um, and, and, and so, you know, that, that challenge of, of space traffic management, is it called, it is something that is uh, definitely being recognized as, as a real issue that we, that we need to take control of. So the US, I think it was last year, announced some, some proposals of looking into what straight space traffic management should look like. The uh, Europe is also looking at developing its own rules and standards. So, so we're definitely heading in the right direction, um, but there's a long way to go. Oh, hopefully. <laughs> kind of moving on to the space community. Yeah. So you founded the London Space Network, and what inspired you to create this? Oh, good question. Um, so it was actually... Uh, yes, yeah, so we started the London Space Network just over a year ago now, last January, and the idea was really simple. So uh, it was co-founded by uh, myself, uh, Manny Shola and, and Nishama, uh, and, and we've been, you know, friends for a long time, uh, as you know, through the space community, um, and, and we really wanted to find a way to bring together the space community in London in a little bit more of a coordinated way. There's a whole host of things that are going on in London, um, but they can be a little bit disjointed, you know, like a you know, university meetup here, a, 
uh, organization here. You've got some companies working in this area. And, and you know, it, it was a little bit spread out, which I guess London is by definition, right? Um, but yeah, so we wanted an excuse to, to bring people together. And we were like, well, if it's only just us three, me in a pub once a month, that's still a pretty good outcome. So, so we, yeah, so we uh, set that up last January, not having any expectations of anyone else turning up. Um, and it's really grown, you know, so we've got, I think, over 500 people on our mailing list now. Um, before this whole crazy COVID situation occurred, we were getting, you know, 80 to 100 people turning up each time. Uh, and it, it's just so wonderful to see different people from across the space community come together. Um, I, I just, I, I find those kind of conversations so energizing, right? It's so cool to see, you know, people who work in space law and people who work in on the finance side uh, and then people who are engineers or scientists and even some people who you know we get a couple of people who come along who don't work in the space industry at all who are looking to get into it or uh, just have a, an interest in in the subject and it's it's a really kind of great group to to kind of get involved in and see what what london and the uk space scene has to offer well, thank you, because everybody is really appreciative of that company and kind of organization. Every event is just fantastic. And I think we said before about in the space medicine, law and business and engineering, that's the thing I love about the space industry, because if you are a lawyer or a doctor, you would never kind of interact with other fields. I'm sure you do, you do, but not to the extent of space, where it's because you're leaving this earth, you have to have a whole set of careers and vocations and just business side. And you need to have a diverse range of people when working on a space team and mm -hmm. that's what I love about it because I don't know going to the women in space drinks event that I, I met some people from from who want to work in the space industry or currently are working in the space industry and it was you business analyst space law and then an actual engineer who is designing all of it so I think it's so fascinating being able to talk to everyone at once mm -hmm. who works in a wide variety of roles in the space industry and even um in high school, I did these, it's called the UK Space Design Competition. It was basically an engineering simulation competition, couldn't rave about it enough. And <laughs> we were put into departments and it was kind of human factors, structural engineering, operations and automations. And at that point I realized like, wow, there's so many departments in space you can kind of bounce around in. And obviously you have your specialty, but it's so eye-opening knowing that there are so many options in the space sector. And one of my friends, he was really involved in all the London space events and extracurriculars and UK sets and stuff like that. But he's actually doing a law degree, but he wants to go into space law. So he has no scientific background at all except for an interest in space. But he's involved in all our extracurriculars and kind of space friends and everything. That's awesome. Yeah, it, it's it's but that's one of the things I wish I knew sooner, right? Is because I, I had it in my head that if you wanted to work in the space industry, you need to have an engineering degree and you need to be prepared to work for as an engineer, right? And that is a fantastic career path, right? Honestly, I, I get so excited seeing the awesome work that, that engineers are doing across the boards, right? Um, but there's a whole host of other things you can do. And some of those other career paths aren't necessarily as clear cut you know I, I'm not going to say that it's it's easy to find uh you know necessarily you know a, a business job in the space industry or, or a space law job you know by definition there might not be as many of them as there are the engineering jobs right um but they still exist right and and there's so many core cool avenues that you can explore and so I think the, the interest and the passion of, in space is like the base, right? But you can do whatever you want out of that, right? Maybe not literally everything you want. We're, we're probably a little bit away from having like hairdressers in space, <laughs> but it's going to happen, right? I guess it has to. <laughs> You're right about that passion. I think there is something so special about when you share a passion for space because I find that people who love space just really, really love it. I love <laughs> talking about it and support everyone in the industry so much. I find that at every single kind of event or meeting or extracurricular that I go to with space people, I don't know how to call them space people, I don't know, students involved in space with people in the career, that they're just really supportive and they're much more supportive and nice and kind of welcoming than other industries. I don't know what it is about it, maybe just because they're really passionate or they, the idea of wanting to work in space is kind of a very like unique niche that 
kind of makes us all very similar in a way and we all just are really excited about it we just want everyone to go to space I don't know what it is about it but I'm really <laughs> grateful I'm honestly so amazed and grateful for the friendships that I've made through the space community yeah it, it honestly it really is such it it is a really kind of tight-knit and uh welcoming community I think because people share that passion in a way that that maybe other other industries don't uh I do wonder this like you know because with the space space community, you've got things like SEDS, you've got uh, SGAC, you've got these, you know, the London Space Network, all these different kind of community events that bring people together where people, you know, people volunteer their time to do a huge amount to, you know, build up the space community, which is which is just incredible. Um, I wonder if other industries have this, do you know what I mean? Like, it's very young professional insurance community that you know do do like weekly seminars and podcasts about how to make it in the insurance industry i don't know if that's true uh but i think there's something special about space you're right you're, you're definitely right there really is what is your favorite aspect of the space community oh god I, 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 hard one. yeah honestly i love how it intersects in terms of so many different sectors like literally what we've just been talk- talking about like the I just love seeing those connections between different fields um, and the space industry is such a fantastic place to do that, right? I, the thing I really love about my job and working in the space industry is I, I, I work on the business side, right? But I'm always talking to the engineers to make sure that the technical work that they're doing maps up to the business you know, service that we're developing or talking to the policy side to see how that feeds into what we're doing on the business front. Um, you know, or being able to do outreach or, you know, all these different things, you, you kind of get to see that bigger picture um, and, and see how it all fits together. And that's what I really love. Exactly. I think that's how the space community differs from the rest of them. Just I'm in a lot of physics societies as well. And I love physics. It's amazing. My favorite as well. But I just don't think it has that specific drive and motivation that the space community has and again like the intersecting careers and i think that's what differs this space community from science ones yeah it's um yeah we're very lucky let's put it that way (laughs) massive congratulations and thank you for being elected the co-chair of space generation advisory council oh thank you very much yeah i'm I'm really thrilled it's gonna be yeah it's gonna be a lot of fun it's really exciting can you just talk about the aims and missions etc about it yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Space Generation Advisory Council is a global nonprofit uh, that supports students and professionals uh, across the world. So, we have over um, over fifteen thousand members and alumni in over one hundred and fifty countries. Uh, we were born out of a initiative by the UN to integrate the perspectives of of the youth, basically, into uh, the, 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 their space. Um, programs. So we we do a whole host of, of amazing things, primarily organizing events around the world. Um, we have uh, national points of contact, so like national representatives in, in a whole host of countries that will, you know, organize events or we organize them on a regional level. Uh, we have project groups that kind of meet virtually uh, on a whole range of different topics from space medicine to security to uh, Earth applications to uh, space exploration. Uh, I could go on. I think there's like ten plus project groups now. Um, what else do we do? Yeah, do, do a lot of work with the UN. So we're a permanent. We have permanent observer status with the UN's committee on the peaceful use of outer space. Um, and, and really, it's about connecting and empowering uh, the next generation to, you know, be active participants in the in the space community, which is really exciting. That word empowerment, I think, is really meaningful because the space industry is so daunting to go into. Mm-hmm. I'm saying, hey, when I say, oh, I want to go in the space industry, they're like, what? Why? Sometimes I mean people, I'm just like, yeah, I want to work in science business, something like that. Because saying I want to work in the space industry is just so serious and like, wow, it's, really? You sure you want to do that? And I think having all these extracurriculars really makes it like more comforting. And mm-hmm. again, it's daunting. Go out of your comfort zone. It's scary. But I think having the connections and knowing people and talking about it more just makes it, it gives you more confidence to go into it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, honestly, it wasn't until 
I went to one of my first SGAC events where I, I met all these people, incredible, like incredibly inspiring people who shared my passion for, for space, but were pursuing it in such a wide variety of ways. Like, you know, knowing that there are people who work in space medicine and space law and space logistics and all these kind of things, it, it really helped to open my eyes up to those opportunities. And like you say, you know, space can kind of be considered in this like ivory tower, right? Where it's like, oh, space is this thing that is far away and it's hard to reach and you don't really know what it does, right? Um, but the more you can kind of get involved and get integrated into that community, the the more the more real it becomes. And then I think those those barriers come down and it becomes more attainable and, and real, right? Exactly. Do you have any advice for university students wanting to enter the space sector? Oh gosh. <laughs> yes. So I, I'm probably not the best person to give this advice because I, when I when I left university, I had no idea what I wanted to do, and honestly, hadn't really spent much time thinking about a job in the space industry because I genuinely didn't think it was something I could do. So, I'm the fool for not discovering UK SEDS. So that's my first piece of advice: is to get involved in the UK SEDS. If you don't have a chapter in your university, start one. That's an even better way of doing it, right? Because you you learn by doing, and that's awesome. Um, yeah, I'd also recommend, you know, checking out SJC as well. It's a fantastic organization. Um, uh, yeah, what else can I say? The other thing would be, you know, look for internships. So the, the, the UK Space Agency funds a number of internships in the space space industry called, it's called the SPIN program, which I think is Space Placements in Industry. They have a number of internships that come up um, on a, you know, every summer. Uh, to do a whole range of things so you know selfish shout out but Astroscale is looking for a business analysis intern right now right so you know those kind of opportunities are available there's science internships there's um yeah there's a whole host so the more experience you can get the better um and, and things like SEDS or SJC are, are fantastic to, to get that knowledge and exposure mm -hmm. what would you say to those interested in the space sector but who maybe don't have the confidence to get involved within the community? Yeah, sure thing. So uh, I guess the other thing I'd say is there's, there's, <laughs> don't put too much pressure on yourself as well, right? I, I think one thing that, that kind of uh, put me off looking at getting involved in the space industry for a long time was the fact that I thought, oh, well, you know, I've got a, I've got a maths degree. I have no internship experience in the space industry. You know, I've, I've got no relevant experience. Why would, why would anyone hire me in, in this sector? Right. Um, and sure, it took time and a lot of work to like get that experience, but you know, you can do that in, in normal ways. You know, you don't necessarily have to have everything figured out by the time, you know, you finish your first year of uni and have everything set up. So there's, that, that's something I want to make clear because I think it's very easy to put a lot of pressure on yourself very early and say, oh, I've got to do this and I've got to do this and then I've got to do this. And that's the only way to get to where I want to be. You know, life happens and, and things often take a much more scenic journey, which is often a lot more fun. Um, and I've completely forgotten what your original question is. I've gone off on a complete tangent. Oh, no. <laughs> it was just any advice to people that are too kind of scared, not confident enough to go into the spectrum. Oh, so yeah. that was it. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, I totally get it. So, yeah, I totally understand. It's definitely something that's daunting. Um, uh, honestly, space community is really friendly, right? I'm, I'm sure, you, Caroline, you can speak to the like the SEDS community as well, which I'm sure is incredibly welcoming. Um, so I, I definitely encourage people to get involved um, uh, at least once to, to see how it is. And, and maybe it won't be as, as scary as you think. Um, the other thing is, you know, there's plenty of resources online or ways that you can, you know, build up that understanding and expertise in a way that, you know, um, can kind of slowly merge you into it. That's definitely what I did. I didn't kind of jump straight in. I was like, oh, right, OK, I'm going to do all these things right now. I spent probably like six months just Googling space organisations to try and get a better understanding before I really signed up to being more actively involved. Yeah, I think for me as well, I kind of was in the community for a bit but then didn't start taking an active role until I was kind of settled in and took some time to get gain the confidence exactly mm -hmm. what would you like to see in the community five years from now 
Oh gosh, I don't know. Yeah, good question. Okay. Um, oh, what would I like to see in five years? You've stumped me. I don't know. I'd like to see there be more opportunities outside the US. I think that's one thing. So that that is another frustration. It's definitely something I, I see a lot with well, through SJC, because it's inherently a global organization. And you see a, a huge amount of opportunity um, in the US, be it, you know, NASA or, or commercial companies that, that are primarily based there. Um, and, and and that was a that was a source of frustration for me as well, to be completely honest. I when I when I left the bank, I, I went to the US. I spent a year studying planetary science um, in California, and it was amazing. But one thing that kind of um, I, I guess I kind of struggled with was like, oh, you know, there's all this opportunity here, but, you know, without a green card or without the, the citizenship, it was very hard to access, right? Um, and I was honestly really kind of nervous about coming back to the UK because I thought, oh, you know, there, there won't be these opportunities here that um, that I, I saw there being in the US. Um, and I think that's really changing. I think there's a whole host of things happening in the UK, um, which is really, really encouraging. So I, I really hope that we see the space sector growing um, and, and diversifying in a way that means that, you know, we have those opportunities in the UK and elsewhere, right? So that the, the space community kind of grows more generally. I couldn't agree more. Despite my accent, <laughs> I actually only know people in the space industry from the UK. <laughs> and I'm really, I'm really grateful for that. That I can have, have my uni degree in America, but then all my space kind of friends and connections and people here. But I also am a big believer on bases international. So it's good to have kind of global contracts. It shouldn't be just kind of like segregated per country. I mean, speaking of accessibility and inclusivity, how do you think you could make the space community more accessible and inclusive to all? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think one thing is there has to be a big education piece, letting people know that this is an actual career that they can take take and pursue right um uh, uh you know I, I spent most of my like you know I, I had was you know i've been incredibly privileged right my, my parents were very supportive of you know me studying maths and, and science and and you know would tell me that you know i could pursue any career that i wanted to and you know that that's fantastic but i didn't really know that space was the thing that i could do because there was no one really around that that did that right um and so I think just kind of breaking down that barrier and letting people know that, that space is something that you can pursue across a whole range of different fields is really empowering. And then two, it's it's really about breaking down those barriers of in terms of why why would people be put off entering the space industry and how can we change that? So, you know, it's still the case that the space sector is a very male dominated environment. Um, and so, you know, what can we do to help encourage um women and, and others who you know might be put off for any number of reasons in terms of getting involved in that sector um, and providing them with the skills and opportunities to make sure that they they can do that right so that's one thing that I really, really want to do with the London Space Network is kind of democratize that access to getting into the space club do you know what I mean it shouldn't be this exclusive niche where you need to know someone to get in but we really want to make it something where you know if you're passionate and you're skilled you can you can you know build that those connections in a way that that maybe maybe in other ways you can't fantastic i was actually just going to ask how would you want to empower the next generation of female leaders in the space sector or kind of what advice would you give them oh gosh uh that's a good question. I mean, so for me, I don't know if it's because I'm a woman or it's just because I'm me, but I really struggle with like self-confidence and imposter syndrome. Uh, I, I think that's not too uncommon, um, but it, it's very easy to take yourself out of the running before anyone rejects you, right? Um, so my biggest piece of advice is to ignore that little seed of doubt in your brain and just go and do the thing anyway, right? Apply for the internship, sign up for the leadership opportunity. Um, you know, being completely honest, I became co-chair of SJC less than two weeks ago. And, you know, I alternate between being, oh, this is amazing. I, you know, what an incredible opportunity. And, oh, gosh, why have I signed up for this? How, how on earth can I be good enough to do this job? Right. So 
I, I think you just have to kind of roll, like, you know, go with the roller coaster and just ignore the doubt and it will pay off, right? And every time you take something on and it works out, you get a little notch of confidence under your belt, right? And then that helps you the next time you're trying to go for something that you're not sure you're going to get. And I think that that is really key. That's such good advice. I just get, just, like, do it, just go for it. <laughs> yeah, what's it can happen you don't get it but you learn something about yourself in the in the process right and yeah speaking of i guess this question relates to the future and now during this lockdown absolutely no events are running or if a student can't access an event do you mm-hmm. have any, uh, do you have any online free resources that are available right now especially <laughs> right now when we're all kind of on our laptops all day Yes, I have the exact thing for you. Um, so actually, SJC has set up like a um, like an online shareable resource full of like tabs of different webinars, online events, online courses, resources, et cetera, et cetera, um, that are available for people to use that are in any way space related. So I will make sure that you have a link to that. And yeah, please do share that amongst your network. And it's open source, so anyone can add extra ideas as well. Oh, fantastic. And I'll link it in the description of this as well. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. This is fantastic. No, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for speaking with me. Of course. Thank you. Brisbane, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed.